Guys, welcome to TFL Talking Trucks podcast. This is Andre, and with me is Nathan. Thank you, Nathan, for joining me once again for this wonderful podcast. And the topic for this show is the brand new 2022 Toyota Tundra. Did they do enough? Yes. So in this segment and on this episode, what we would like to discuss is everything we know. And now we know everything. And, almost. We're, per- and we're permitted to tell you guys about yes, it. Yes. And it's all the embargoes are behind us. And but we want to step back. Right. Right. Because, uh, you know, I was actually at the event in Texas. Uh, I was fortunate enough to represent TFL there mm-hmm. uh, with Toyota. And uh, I was trying to learn on the fly. Right. But now we had a little bit of a couple days, a few days. Um, to think about it and analyze it and really kind of get to the bottom of this. Um, did Toyota do enough to just reset the bar and compete in this segment? That is the whole point of this podcast. But what we want to do, and th- I'm going to give you the lowdown of what we're going to be doing, and then after that we're going to talk to you Patreons, is we're going to talk about design, the chassis, powertrains, interior, technology, price, and MPG. These are all things that I think you guys think, and Andre thinks you guys think, is the most important. And the reason we're starting with design is because that's the first thing you see. Because let's face it, before anything else came out, you saw those leaked photos. And some of you guys had some interesting things to say. I cannot repeat them because we're sort of a family show. But... um, (laughs) Wow. Anyway, during during yeah. that, uh, about midway through, we're going to talk about news. Uh, and Andre's got some great news. I don't know. Truck news. Great. Truck news. Yeah. W- truck which news. is always great news, right? Truck news. So so let's hit it. Uh, before we start, though, do you want to talk about uh, our Patreon? Yeah, I want to thank a few people. Absolutely. As, al- as always. Because as you guys know, uh, the podcast and overall TFL Studios, you know, it's it, we exist because of you. Yep, thank <laughs> you guys. Because you, you guys listen to us, you guys watch our videos, and, and some of you support us uh, on patreon.com slash tflcar, mm-hmm. which is our only kind of page on Patreon. And uh, within the last couple of days, Anthony Gallo, Greg Van Mullen, and Michael Jones. Hey, I did it. You did it, and you got them all right. <laughs> I think I got ding, them all ding. right. Uh, these guys supported us in a big way. And if you guys think, you know, a couple bucks a month here and there is not a big deal, Nothing. It means a lot to us because it adds up. It does add up. You, studio, everything you see here, a lot of that is sponsored by you guys. So thank you very much for your sponsorship. And thank you for those of you who are listening to us and watching us. We appreciate that as well. Yeah, if you want total proof of this, uh, if you're watching this, uh, behind Nathan is a hood of a 1978 Lincoln Continental. And on that hood are many, many names of you guys who supported us. Yeah, that was our our first batch of fundraising to get to where we are now. And it really worked. So thank you guys again. Um, Should we get to it? Yeah, let's talk Tundra. Okay. Yes. So before we actually start on those bullet points we were talking about, let's talk about the competition first. Yes. Um, Just because you guys, for those of you who don't know where the Tundra fits, Andre's going to tell you. Well, absolutely. So the best-selling vehicle in the U.S. is a pickup truck. Uh, that's the Ford right. F-150. Uh, F-Series, right. Mm-hmm. And F-Series, of course, includes anything from a work F-150, mm-hmm. right, uh, just a basic work truck, all the way to very luxurious F-150s, and then also super-duty trucks, which is their heavy-duty right. trucks, three-quarter tons and one-ton trucks. These are you know heavier trucks that can pull big loads and carry a lot of weight. Um, so... So that's that's a Ford, but <laughs> there's there's five huge players here. Yeah, GM with Chevy and GMC, mm-hmm. uh, same kind of layout as Ford, right? right. With light duty, full size, and heavy duty. Um, and then of course there's Ram, once yep. again, full size and heavy duty. Uh, and of course Nissan and Toyota are in this space. That is correct. Nissan somewhat recently refreshed their Titan, but honestly, it was really just a refresh as opposed to building an all-new truck. Uh, General Motors, they are releasing some interesting stuff. We've covered that in prior podcasts and other um, you know videos that we've done. But in terms of all-new trucks for 2022 that are half-ton, Toyota's the one. 
This is it. Yeah. So the F-150 is, is going to get small updates, yeah. like you said. Last year uh, it was heavily updated. Right. The 2021 year was their Pretty kind of a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the, they kept the, the chassis. Same, yeah, the platform they and most of the engines. some of the cab the same, right? Right. So, so they updated a lot of the truck. Right. Um, in 2022, the new Raptor R is rumored to come. Mm-hmm. So that could be a splash later on, mm-hmm. right? Uh, GM, like you said, updated their trucks. Mm-hmm. Yes, they did. Yeah. GMC news is probably on the way soon. I'm sure it's right around the corner. Um, and Ram, of course, is doing special packages. That's part of our news. Yep. Uh, that's not going to be an all-new truck or right. a heavily updated truck in 2022. So Toyota has had about 14 years to think about this <laughs> because the last generation of the Tundra uh, lasted about 14 years. And of course, as any manufacturer, they've been listening to customers, right? Right. Uh, trying to figure out what's best and you know what to do in the future. And this is their answer. And Toyota is... Well, I'm, globally, I mean, they're one of the top companies as far as sales. They are one of the largest companies yeah. in the world. They are one of the more dominant companies in the world. And what's important to Toyota, they're one of the most consistent companies yes. in the world. And if you look at other segments like a compact crossovers, mm-hmm. the RAV4, uh, they dominate that segment. Yeah, they're killing. Well, they're, they're right there with Honda. Well, but, yes, yes. But uh, they have more to offer in terms of actual product, more of them to offer. So... Uh, they also do a lot of platform sharing, and they work with other automakers as well. Some automakers don't do that very much. Um, that's including an all-new the Toyota Corolla Cross. I can't even pronounce it. I'm the one who you recently that uh, test drove it. Yep, that's in Texas, and uh, we even took it off-road. We have a little off-road video, sort of off-road, and um, that platform is shared with other Toyotas. And the thing about Toyota is that that's what they do. They have the TNGA platform name, and that goes for everything, including this new truck. They and there's have yeah, subcomponents of that. Precisely, right. precisely. So before we get to all that, and before we talk about that, let's start with design. Yes. Because design is really what it's about. Once again, you guys saw the photos way, way early, and some of you were not too pleased, well, and some of you were. Well, that's not an ideal way to reveal a truck. And and mm. we've seen that with other manufacturers before, right? right? Where there's some sort of a spy image, either from a factory or maybe from a dealership. There's meeting. a leak. Something happens, right. and usually it's warped. It's taking on the side somewhere, and then it's poor lighting. Or it's moving. It's like a UFO. It's fuzzy around the corner. Yeah, so that's yeah. not a great way. So, um, so we... Well, we actually did a video about your comments as well, mm-hmm. and I think the appearance was one of the top topics. That's right? precisely. And, but but if you think about it, that makes sense because that's the thing you have to stare at in your garage or in your driveway or when you get to work and the other guys are coming out and whether they're like, oh, dude, awesome truck, or mm, I don't know about that. So, so uh, it's subjective. It you is know, indeed. W- all of us, you know, you and I have our own opinions. <laughs> you guys have our own opinions. Yeah. But one thing that Toyota actually said in one of their presentations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, they wanted to show strength, yeah. right? As any pickup truck should. Right. And one of their inspirations was Iron Man, but they said it was the superhero Marvel character. Right. Not Iron Man Stewart. Ivan, our yeah. buddy. So it was a little confusing that they went that route. For one thing, Toyota doesn't really have a deal with Marvel that I'm aware of. But more importantly, for years, their development has been, for pickup trucks, off-road ones especially, has sort of orbited around Ivan Ironman Stewart. He is one of the winningest Baja champions out there. I mean, he's definitely, you know, way up there. And a lot of you guys have heard about him. And he's been with Toyota for years and years and years. And, in fact, all of us have had a meeting with him or have driven with him. Yes. Um, So, for example, when I believe the original TRD Pro lineup was introduced, this was back in 2015, 2016, Mm -hmm. uh, Roman had a chance to drive as a passenger with Ivan Man. Uh, Ivan Ivan Man? Man? I know. And you should be able to say Ivan with no problem, bro. It's Ivan. (laughs) <laughs> That's the Russian pronunciation, Ivan. No, no, no. Uh, Ivan Ironman Stewart. And then just a few months ago, I was in Texas mm-hmm. at the kind of an overall update Toyota event. And he took me around an off-road course in the Lexus LX. Yeah, and I, I got to ride with him as well in between those times for a very brief time. And all three occasions, he was a gentleman. Yes. He was just... Totally laid back. Down to earth. Down to earth. And he still would push those vehicles. And, and he is in his 70s, folks. Right yeah, now. I mean, same age as Roman, pretty much. Oh, ouch. Sorry. He's not, he's not uh, no, 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 no. But, but so, 
and that's their heritage too, right? Right, right. That's, that's exactly a, my point. But it, it represents durability because mm-hmm. we're talking about endurance off-road racing. Exactly. Uh, and uh, Iron Man Stewart um, is was king of that. Indeed. Uh, endurance driving and actually taking care of your truck, but also going fast. That was his specialty. Um, and so that's fine. Yeah. Right. So no matter what the, no matter which way you look at this, Iron Man is a good image. It so, is, but but it, but it doesn't. I don't understand why the guy who's doing the presentation, maybe there's some sort of contractual thing. I don't know. But instead of going to the direction of saying, yeah, Iron Man, this dude who was the amazing off-road badass, you know, helped us, you know, figure out what we wanted to build with this truck. It's no, it's the Marvel character who, by the way, died. And sorry, spoilers. Ooh. Um, you know, with a snap of his fingers, he's gone. I just don't quite get that, and I'm going to give you my subjective perspective on this truck in just a minute. But okay. you, you see where my point is with that too, right? Uh, this, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, so thankfully, and we have some you know images here on the video. If mm. you're listening to us, thank you for joining us. And of course, you can see this on tfltruck.com or TFL Truck YouTube channels. Um, and uh, well, I want to hear your opinion. I saw the truck in the flesh. Yeah, um, and actually several of them because they um, they had approximately like six different trim levels um, and actually seven trucks to look at and uh, they're all a little bit different yeah you know some of them have chrome grills some do not some have painted lowers some do not um, so what do you what is some of your perspective without seeing it in the flesh okay first of all you will not mistake it for anything else that's one thing for sure uh, front ends of trucks have become very distinctive and this is one of them. <laughs> I can't, you know, I, I'm not going to look at it and think, hmm, that looks like a Ford. The only truck it kind of reminds me of a little bit in terms of design is Chevrolet. Just a little bit with the squinty eyes, the, the you know, the yeah, really. Yeah, and also the, a lot of people commented on the vertical little slits on the sides, right? A little bit. Yeah. That's exactly where I was going with that. Have you guys seen, speaking of comic books and comic book heroes, uh, the Batman movie where I think it's Batman Rises or whatever, where there's that character Bane who has the giant little grill on his face. That is what the front end of this looks like. As a matter of fact, I threw out a tweet a while ago, and it looks just like that. I think it looks kind of mean and menacing when it's on the TRD like this. The other images I've seen of it with the chrome and everything else and the, and the less prominent wheels and all that, well, actually... Less prominent tires, I should say. The wheels were huge. Mm-hmm. It didn't. I, I didn't think it looked very good. Um, I'm not saying it's bad. I have not seen it in person, so I have to do that. And here is the most important thing that I think about design. Does it look good, dirty? I don't care about a clean truck. I want to see a truck covered halfway in mud and muck. If it looks badass when it's covered, then you know it's a good truck. And the good so, news is a lot of trucks do look pretty damn good when they're dirty. I have a comment on this because, yes. um, so I was there at this event, which mm-hmm. was a journalist event, not a public event. Right. Uh, and of course, the truck is uh, actually displayed at Motorbella uh, mm-hmm. in Detroit. So uh, I think this show, uh, this podcast is airing during this weekend where mm-hmm. you can go to Detroit uh, M1 concourse and see actually a lot see it of in the person, trucks. right? So you can see it there. It's also going to be available to watch and walk around in person at the State Fair of Texas. That is correct. So, so and you guys will be there, right? Uh, well, not immediately. Not immediately. Uh, the State Fair of Texas, of course, is a multi-week event. Right, right, right. That right. goes, you know, just a celebration of the fall and everything else. Um, so you guys, if you're in Texas, if you're in Michigan, you guys can see these trucks already. Right. Uh, they're going to be produced and on sale, Toyota says, uh, this year. But there's a piece of news that's coming up related to this. Uh, that will touch, uh, which is kind of a kind of a big news, I think. Okay, uh, let's get on to the next few things, and then we'll get to the news. Well, w- uh, one more thing I wanted oh, sure. to mention about the appearance. You mentioned mud. Yes. So I was laying down on the stage um, underneath one of the trucks, and uh-huh. this was the orange color TRD TRD Pro. Right. And I uh, was because I was checking out the exhaust system that mm-hmm. was coming out on the on the driver's side, which was kind of odd to me yeah, because usually is. it's coming out on the opposite side, right? That is correct. And I saw mud underneath it. You know how it's a show vehicle, right? It's a prototype. Right. It was an early pre-production unit, and um, but of course they couldn't get all the mud off of it because there's a little bit of mud underneath. So, so it means they it showed may- it in pictures. Uh-huh. They showed it driving. So of course. 
it was used already. So it was a driver as opposed to just something that they roll out of a trailer and put on stage. No, no, no. Yeah, it was not a queen. That's kind of cool, actually. Queen. I, yeah. I, do, I do like that. I appreciate that fact. Yeah, and the same thing happened to me when I was at the Silverado ZR2 event. Mm-hmm. Uh, the blue truck that I remember you, you, you freaked out about that one. Yeah, we looked underneath and it was brown. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, what is this? Oh, it's mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not rust, by the way. Um, so, so it was... So these trucks, a lot of them were being f- videoed and photographed in the real world. They're all driving. Right. Uh, these are pre-production trucks, so not production ready. Um, but that was cool. That was cool to see that Toyota did that. I agree. And um, one final note on the design of the truck. I don't mind the profile so much. Uh, it's, it, it, I just think that they could have done something else. I, maybe it's the headlights that I really don't like, along with the grill and... The wheel arches, maybe. Anyway, let's move on to chassis because that's where things start to improve in my book. Yeah, and also I had a wonderful opportunity, and Mike Swears, the chief engineer, was very gracious with his time. Mike is a Um, great guy. Yeah. He's a busy he's, guy. He's easy to talk to. Uh-huh. He's once again down to earth. And he's extremely knowledgeable because he knows his product. Well, heck yeah. And, and he's, uh, he's poured his whole you know, professional <laughs> career into this because mm. he's been the chief truck designer at Toyota for 12 years. Right. And, of course, he has other experience uh, before that. So he was very gracious. He talked me through uh, a lot of the chassis changes. And this was very, very interesting because uh, – and I knew he was in – um, I knew he was in Japan for a while. I wasn't sure why or how long. Mm-hmm. It turns out um, they sent about, he said about 42 people, 42 engineers from U.S. to Japan um, to kind of the headquarters, the global headquarters. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to consolidate all these truck platforms into one, which was, a, I imagine, a humongous task. So you're saying Hilux and some of these overseas trucks, yes. all of them are going to be sharing a lot of the components in the, on the frame, the platform. Yeah, totally. Um, absolutely. And that yeah. includes the new Land Cruiser, which we were speculating about just, yes. just a couple months so, ago. So Mike had to walk, of course, you know, this fine line about telling me about the Tundra mm-hmm. and the chassis changes without mentioning anything else. Like the Tacoma. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I kept really wanting to ask him, tell me about the 400, tell me about the mm-hmm. Sequoia, tell me about the Tacoma. Because the rumor is that all of them will be sharing the same uh, platform. And you might be asking yourself, what? I mean, how can you make a giant Tundra into a small Tacoma? Well, this, uh, w- what this actually is, is you can manufacture it on a similar production line, which means it has the same attachment points as far as carrying it on the, um, on the conveyor. Yeah, the, the hard points for moving it from point A to point B are the same. And often they'll use a lot of the same frame components, which are probably going to be fully boxed, I would imagine, and all that. Did they go to a, a, a C-channel uh, back component of the frame or anything like that? Because they did that on the Tacoma. Right, so they completely moved away from that um, philosophy. So as you know right now, the Tacoma and the Tundra have what they call a triple flex, I believe. Yeah. Triple frame design, which includes... A fully boxed front, yeah, kind of a heavy reinforced C open uh, frame like this, C channel in the middle, and then a kind of a open C in the back, and that's for flexing, right? That's according to them, and a lot of you guys do not like their uh, response to that, and uh, I, I'm sort of neutral on it, especially after driving a lot of Tacomas and Tundras and knowing how tough they are. However, I can see the other side of it, which is other automakers are going to fully boxed frames that are much more robust. Yeah, and so Toyota did also. Yep. So right, so now it's a fully boxed frame, mm-hmm. fully redesigned, and you know, and they had the opportunity to actually shape it just the way they wanted it. So they made it a little bit wider in the rear, and he talked me all through this. So mm-hmm. if you want to actually get uh, a little bit more detail, you could also listen or watch the previous podcast. Right. Um, but they fully redesigned it. But they also had to, because of this, they had to fully redesign the uh, the suspension right because mike what what mike wanted to get across is that when you make this uh chassis stiffer the frame um you're gonna feel more energy or from bumps right because which makes total sense so you have to redesign the suspension to accommodate for that and they did and they went coil springs coils in the rear yeah yeah now coil springs is the crazy part one thing (laughs) we figured out a little bit early but honestly not a lot of you guys were expecting and Honestly, considering how long Ram has been using coil springs and the fact that other people are 
uh, moving towards that direction, you know, Jeep did it with their Wrangler. It is a robust suspension if it's done right, and it can also make it a lot easier to put in an air suspension, which is another thing that Toyota's playing with. Yeah, they did actually air uh, optional air suspension in the rear. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this on some other trucks. Um, uh, well, actually, Ram uses four-corner air suspension as well. That, uh, one of the things they have, they optional yeah. for. Yeah, and, and I mean, Tundra has a lot of suspension choices. Um, and I actually asked uh, Mike about this too, because it, it seemed mi- mind-boggling. So they have standard uh, first of all, every truck gets coils in the rear. Yeah, front it's and rear. Not, yeah. So it's not like one truck, you know, luxury truck does and the other one doesn't. Right. So all of them get that. Uh, independent front, mm-hmm. solid rear axle, of course. Of course. Uh, with coils in the in the rear. And then they have a TRD Pro, um, I'm sorry, TRD Offward package is, is a package you can add to several trims. So it's not like a Tacoma where it's its own trim. Mm-hmm. So you can get an SR5 TRD off-road. Right, and that gives you uh, the beefed-up suspension a little yes, bit. Yes, and they're using Bilstein shocks for okay. that. So once again, specially tuned. That's uh, the first level then. That's the first level. Okay. There's another level where it's uh, for luxury. Mm-hmm. Um, they're using um, adaptive variable suspension. So shocks that are, that are adjusting their stiffness depending on driving conditions. Okay. And you know other manufacturers like Ford, GM and others are using similar similar technology. Yeah. yeah. Not all done the same, but similar concept, right? Yeah, got it. Where it's adjusting dynamically and it's not like uh, you know a Raptor or TRX shock. It's more of a so it's not like you can have you know many many different modes that control that it's more done behind the scenes mm-hmm. you know the truck is kind of doing it for you right so you don't have to sit there and flip or hit yeah buttons but or, you, you know. can still do that but but it's more kind of a done behind the scenes okay for you. got it a- and then they have fox two and a half inch shocks on the trd pro with the reservoir right yes with the remote reservoirs and if that wasn't enough they have a TRD Sport package. You've seen this before, right? Yes, we, we, we've seen this before on many Tacoma and Tundra trucks, which has a slow, slight lowering. It's for the street, basically. Right. So it's lowered a little bit and has yet another tuning for shocks. So this is a lot of options, dude. It is. The good news is for the consumer, they'll be able to dial in pretty much the truck they really want. Um, right off the bat, if you're wondering, and there's no reason to wonder, yes, of course, the TRD Pro is the one that we, TFL Truck, would be most interested in. And I have a feeling that that would be, you know, not their, necessarily their volume seller, but damn close to it. I bet you they're going to sell a ton of those. And the other ones will be, you know, 10% here, 15% there. Uh, but, of course, it's probably going to be in their mid-level. Is it SE model? No. Um, for well, they're, they're limited. Uh, they call it limited. Limit is now there is is the middle. Is, is it kind of the middle? Yeah, gets confusing uh, because of because Ford, Ford yeah. and Ram do something else. Yeah. Their limited models are very, very, very top. Right. Um, I wonder Tundra, if that's going to tick off Ford and Ram. I don't know why they chose the, why Toyota chose this, I but but it's it's also been uh, this is what they've done in the past too. Mm-hmm. So it's not brand new for twenty twenty two. So it's not they're not completely redesigning their playbook. Okay. Uh, but. Um, you know, we don't have pricing yet. So it's hard to say exactly, you know, where these will land. Um, we can assume that they're going to be competitive. Yes, absolutely competitive. And TRD Pro is one of their, they called it hero models, which means it's going to be very luxurious, mm-hmm. uh, very, very powerful. We're going to talk about power next. Yep, we're going to talk about um, it next. Uh, and also um, a very capable, too. So it's not going to be cheap. Right, it's not going to be at the middle middle <laughs> of no, the road. Uh, yeah, it's so, going to be near the top. I would so, imagine. so, and their other top model is the seventeen ninety four, which That's is exactly a Western uh, themed luxury, truck. like a King Ranch or you know, like a Longhorn would be in the Ram. Exactly. So something like this. So let's go to power because this this will before we go. What what I what? Have one question because I don't see it on our little list. We didn't talk about uh, tire uh, wheel and tire packages. Uh, I know there's at least four that I can think of. Obviously, the one that's used on the TRD Pro, which is different than the one that's available on the off-road package. And then yes. there's probably a standard base model uh, tire and wheel package. And I think maybe with the Limited or or the 1794, there's that really large wheel I saw, which was like a 20-inch wheel, I think? Yeah, so I can only speak to what we saw. Yeah. 
and the full configurator is not online yet. So I know. Uh, as soon as it does, we're going to build one. Oh, we're going to, and that or will build, be on video. Build many, yeah, on video with you guys. Um, but uh, so the TRD Pro has a special forged wheel, mm -hmm. and they're very proud of that because forging uh, makes that uh, wheel stronger. Stronger, and, and it can be a little bit lighter than. Uh, yeah. and, and, on, and also, it has an offset. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit, it makes the track a little bit wider as well. Yeah. So it has a different type of uh, uh, offset compared to others. And those are 18s. Okay. So they also have potentially 19 and 20s. I saw 20s a lot. Uh, that was uh, the 1794 had a 20. Right. Um, the other tier, the Sport package, had an optional 20. Um, and they're different styles. So some of them are blacked out. Some of them are not. Some of them have chrome. Um, so there will be plenty of options. And right. tires, um, they, they went for Falcon uh, Wild Peaks. That's interesting. Falcon's really starting to get in there. With, uh, for uh, the Pro. For the Pro. Uh, so yeah. this is kind of their top. Uh, but they did a 33. So what do you think about this? So, they look small. So, yeah, one of these white, uh, tr uh, the white truck uh, that we're showing on, on camera is um, is a TRD Pro with 33s. Yeah. Um, I, I, in aesthetically, I'm sure that they function really good. I, I know Toyota spends a lot of time developing these things, and they they figured it out. Um, I'm going to say that at the very least, I would have gone 35. And maybe it's because the wheel wells actually look even wider and larger because of the black trim. Yes, totally. The flares are blacked out. Yeah. So the the, the wheel opening looks larger. It, that's, that's exactly yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I'm totally with you. And you know what's going to happen? Hmm. Uh, people will lift them. Oh, God, without it. Well, yeah. And big tires. So, so it's a truck. Here's a piece of news that I did not mention during our initial debut. Uh huh. Uh, Toyota said, um, actually, they, this is the information they officially released that they're going to have a TRD, um, they call it a TRD suspension lift, optional, dealer installed. So if you buy one of these trucks, actually, it may work on multiple trims, not just the Pro. Okay. Uh, it's a three-inch lift. Three-inch? From a dealer with, you know, with warranty. So, so I don't know a lot of more details about mm. what shocks they're going to be using yeah. and what they're going to be doing. Or spacers or whatever. But they're right? thinking that way. You know, like everybody has accessories. Now. Sure. You know, you can buy a Bronco with 150 accessories or whatever. Well, TRD has always had accessories. I mean, they used to have superchargers and all that. Yeah. I mean, the question, of course, and I'm dying to know, are they going to, because it's coil spring. It's not that e It's not the same thing as lifting a truck that has leaf springs in the back where you put a block in there yeah. or whatever in some cases. So I'm curious to how they're going to do so, it. So it may not be very affordable. I, I'm not saying, we, we don't know the pricing We yet, don't know. But it may be well done, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, when you're paying money, you know, it's going to be done right. So maybe right. it's going to be a different spring, which uh, makes the ride more comfortable instead of adding a block and shortening your travel potentially. Right. You know, so uh, we may see many different solutions for this. This is going to be interesting. And the cool part is most likely we will be able to get our hands on one of those because Toyota tends to send us their top trim model and they know we do off-roading, they know we do towing. So I have a feeling that they will be sending us one of those in the relatively near future. Um, should we move on to powertrains? Because that's the big news, too. Yeah, so let's do it. Let's let's transition to that. Okay. Um, powertrains. Yeah. We, back in, before we got started, before before we really knew what was going on with Tundra, there were a lot of hints being dropped about what that powertrain was because they revealed overseas the Toyota Land Cruiser. And that Toyota Land Cruiser had a twin-turbocharged V6. And we heard a lot of stuff about the transmission and 10 speeds and all that. But of course, nothing was confirmed. And we didn't honestly know. But then Toyota leaked some pictures. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because one of the pictures showed some orange things in the background. And orange usually is indicative of uh, hybrid wiring. It's just for emergency stuff, you know, so you know <laughs> where not to grab. Um, and guess what? They have both the twin turbocharged V6 and the twin turbocharged V6 with a hybrid system. Sound familiar? You're damn right it does because Ford basically did the same thing. And it's the same, dis almost the same displacement. Right. Three and a half liters is quote unquote the name. Uh, it's like 3,445 cubic uh, uh, centimeters. I'll say three and a half. So liters. three and a half liters. So apparently that displacement is probably most optimal mm -hmm. for not just you know Ford, but other engine builders and designers. Uh, they're using very similar displacement. Um, and this is the def of the V8. The, yep. So, as far as we can tell, because they didn't hint at anything else. 
and this is the powertrains. And Mike talked about it with me, and I can mention that here. Um, and also, um, they were very careful about how they described it because they wanted to convey, you know, the durability and the reliability, which is what Tundra is known for. They've been developing uh, this for a long time. Um, a very similar engine um, kind of configuration is currently in the Lexus LS, mm -hmm. which is their flagship sedan. That's correct. Um, so they used some of the learnings from that and what they know from this engine and developed the truck version of it because it has to have high torque, mm -hmm. uh, lots of power, and 10-speed automatic, like you said, to deliver that and tow a lot. Now let's talk about what they used to have. So they got rid of their 5.7 liter V8 and their 4.7 liter V8. I mean, those are gone. Yes. And also they were a six speed? They were all six speeds. They were all six yeah. speed transmissions. They were not the most efficient. Um, Toyota back then, a year ago, was one of the least efficient um, out there in terms of truck makers. Even Nissan went to a nine speed uh, automatic transmission and had better efficiency. Now, Toyota is jumping up, and now they're with Ford, not only with technology, but with their transmissions, and we can only assume what their efficiency is going to be. However, it's logical to assume that the hybrid will be more efficient. The question is, is it on the same footing as the Ford hybrid? And you should know, because you got one. Yeah, um, there's an issue. We don't know EPA estimates or That's Toyota correct. estimates we don't for have efficiency. Yet. And that was later on our list, but let's talk about it now. Yeah, we, we could just we, talk we, about it. We don't know. Yeah, we, we just um, don't know. So uh, Mike Swears, the chief engineer, hinted at some of this. Wow. He said towing maximum uh, rating on this new Tundra, which is 12,000 pounds. Which is impressive. Which is impressive, but not class leading. Nope. Um, the, f he said you could drive four hours with that load before filling up. That's very cryptic. <laughs> so so what does that, that mean, mean 75 miles per hour towing a heavy load? He didn't mention the speed. He mentioned you could go from, um, he used Michigan terminology. Okay. You know, from Ann Arbor, anyway, drive four hours with a trailer. And so a lot of you helped me out with this in the comments mm -hmm. in other videos. And you said, well, this could translate to about seven and a half or eight MPG while towing. We don't know exactly what he meant I think it's a that. really good guess, but we just don't but, know. But that could be a decent number considering our history and what we've done with Ford F-150s. Yeah, and considering what that weight is, he's talking maximum weight, I think, And he's right? talking about uh, a box trailer, basically mm. dragging a big box behind you loaded to 12,000 pounds. Yeah, maximum load. So uh, there, there's a funny part to that because I, I remember overhearing that and I, I shook my head thinking, okay, there's got to be another translation. I don't know if you guys have driven around Ann Arbor, Michigan before, but the traffic can be so bad that four hours worth of driving is at 100 miles. <laughs> You know, so we don't know exactly. We, we just we don't know. The bottom line, that, that's really cryptic. He didn't say how many miles you can go, right. et cetera, et cetera. We do know the tank is 32 gallons. Mm -hmm. So they currently have a 38 in their current generation truck. They shrunk it down to 32. And obviously, he explained it by saying, we're going to be more efficient. We don't need as much fuel. Uh, so hence, we can actually save weight yeah. and blah, yada, 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 yada. Yeah, yada. because, I mean, as much as I would want a 38-gallon tank, believe me, that would be awesome. The other side of it is those extra gallons translates to more weight in the truck, and they're trying to strip down weight, which reminds me, this truck is a lot lighter, potentially, than the, the former one. Well, we don't know specifically yet. Yeah, because the all the specs are done. I can tell you what um, payload stickers I saw. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about payload right now. Let's just move on there. Okay. Uh, because this is what pickups are about. Well, right? we haven't said what the, the numbers of the powertrain are. Okay. So yeah, the, the, base, the base motor, please. the base motor, which is a three and a half liter twin turbo V6, mm -hmm. um, has a 389 horsepower rating and then 479 pound feet of torque rating at 2400 RPM. That's Very low RPM. Really good. Uh, um, Ford rates their engines at about 3,000 RPM max right. torque. This rating is at 2,400 RPM. I think I made a mistake in my previous videos about this because when I was talking to Mike, he mentioned um, regular fuel, mm -hmm. 87 octane. 
uh, the ratings, but then there was some documentation online that said this for premium fuel. Oh. I'm sorry, we're still working out some of those uh, miscommunications there. So we don't know for sure if that's on premium or on Yeah, premium. let's assume premium, okay, to be safe. Okay. So Ford gives their ratings of about 400 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque on premium fuel. Mm. Uh, this is 389 and 479. So it's not as high as what Ford is currently saying. Right. So is it good or bad? Well, it's we a lot higher than it used know. to be. It's higher than the V8. Yeah. It has way more torque than the old V8, which yep. was 401 uh, pound-feet of torque. Um, and it comes in early because the V8, you would have to rev it up quite high. Yeah, I think you were at 4,000 RPM and change in order to get maximum. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's kind of the old school of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. Revving that V8 and hearing it and getting the power out of it. But this behaves a little bit more closer to a diesel in that respect yeah. because you're going to a lower RPM to get your maximum torque. Totally. Yeah. Um, Diesel-like. And actually, a lot of your comments uh, on previous uh, shows we did said, where's the diesel? Come on, Toyota. And, and Mike addressed it briefly by saying that he's a diesel fan, uh -huh. which was, a, I think, a big nod to the enthusiasts. I think there. I agree. But he said it's too hard now to certify it. it. takes about three years, according to Toyota, to certify a brand new engine, which they wanted to get it on sale. So, so they couldn't have a diesel this minute. I don't know if, if that means diesel is coming in a couple of years from now. They did not... Obviously, like any manufacturer, they did not speak about future products. Right. But he is said he was a diesel fan. You, you could take that any, one you, any way you want to take it. But there is another powertrain that puts out a very different numbers. More. So hybrid, mm -hmm. right? And Ford was, is already have, has one available, which is their, once again, three and a half liter hybrids in the F-150. It's a tandem hybrid system to where you have the electric motor sandwiched in between the engine and the transmission, and it actually helps the transmission, if, if you want to think about it that way, in terms of moving the vehicle. And it also works as a start-stop system, I believe. Yeah, and it can power certain accessories and drive in electric-only mode for a very, very short distances. Right. So it's not a plug-in. Uh, the Ford is not a plug-in. The Tundra is not a plug-in. It's a, it's a full hybrid system. Mm -hmm. And Toyota has a similar architecture where the motor, electric motor is sandwiched between the 10-speed and the engine. Mm -hmm. um, it can go on electricity alone, uh, short distances or, or lower speeds. But then it helps the gas engine basically make power, which is 437 horsepower. Mm -hmm. Now it's more than what Ford is saying. Right. Ford is rated at 430. So Toyota just kind of one up them. Yeah, just a little bit. And they, they one up the torque as well. The Tundra torque is 583 pound-feet of torque. Yeah. 583. We're approaching 600 pound-feet of torque in a hybrid. Right. Now, if you guys want uh, reference to what you would compare that to, I believe the TRX puts out 650 pound-feet yes. of torque. So, so it's approaching supercharged V8 It's numbers. getting to some seriously monstrous levels, which means, of course, you know, more capability when it comes to towing and off-the-line power, I would imagine. I am really curious about that powertrain. So the question is, these are the only two choices. That's it. Um, there's no other transmissions. There are no other engine options. So can you imagine base truck? You, so you can buy, you will be able to buy a Tundra SR5 mm -hmm. or SR. The, uh, the SR truck the trim level is their lowest. Okay. With 389 horsepower. Uh, this, you know, non-hybrid engine. That's really good for a base truck. You know, Nissan offers V8 and everything. Yeah, right? Every yeah it's Titan, the 5.6 on everything. Yeah, uh, Titan is offered. So it's similar kind of me methodology here. Yeah. So you're getting really, really powerful engine no matter which truck you're buying. Right. That means uh, some of you guys are going to have a really good time if you're Toyota fans. I, but this is enough. Can we? Can, that's our theme, right? Yeah. What do you What do you think? Uh, Ford offers like five or six powertrains. GM offers five or six powertrains. Mm -hmm. Uh, including diesels. Actually, I think For GM now offers more because they... Yeah, uh, Ford discontinued their light-duty diesel right. in the F-150. Uh, Ram offers, what, two or three powertrains if you look at e-torque systems. Yeah. They're mild hybrid systems. So do you think Toyota did enough here? I, I, I guess they didn't answer the question of whether or not they pipe in noise, right? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> okay. I'm assuming they're not going to. I really hope they don't. Uh, in all honesty... The numbers look good. 
Toyota does not build a powertrain without testing it extensively, and they want to keep their pu- public image on a good note, meaning reliability, capability. That's really important to them, right? Without driving the truck, I will say that these numbers are interesting. I will say that I'm assuming that this is going to be a lot more efficient than the previous truck. This is an assumption. And with all of that being said, on top of that, that they obviously benchmarked Ford. Come on. You know they benchmarked Ford. And they may have beat Ford at their own game. With that being said, I say yes, they've done enough. Based on what I have on paper. Right. We don't we don't <laughs> we know. Have, we, we haven't, haven't driven, driven it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So so I would so first of all, I'm impressed that you can buy a base Tundra with this powertrain. That that's really cool. So you know, I, I'm assuming it's going to be competitively priced. So that's already good. Mm-hmm. So I think they did do enough there. Am I sad about the V8 being gone? Yes, but I think it was we have the best to... with the TRD package. That thing had or exhaust package. I was one of the best sounding V8s out there. It sounded great. But I think I mean this is the future, right? Right. Efficiency is very important because. Uh, right now in Colorado, the fuels are near four dollars a gallon. In I'm California, they're $5, near five dollars a gallon. Yeah. So in the future, it may be more. So most of us will not be able to afford filling up these t- trucks. Not to mention cafe mandates for the future and yeah. what's required electrification and taking those, you know, the figures that we're looking at in terms of efficiency and dropping them and making them as you know not only as efficient as possible but as green as possible. And hybridization is something that Toyota does really well. And almost 500 pound-feet of torque or 600 pound-feet of torque in these cases, I think it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, so no matter what, like, it's really fun. Uh, I own an F-150 hybrid. When you want to accelerate in that hybrid, it's fun. Yeah. Yes, am I getting the V8 noise? No. Mm-hmm. But it's just fun to be able to accelerate and pass cars. And I think you're already past the whole thing of, oh, I missed the V8. You're just really happy with the truck. Quick question for you. Uh, do they talk about rear ends? No. And I, I was didn't have enough time to okay. discuss this. I'm assuming there may be two different options depending on the hybrid versus not. Kinda, yeah, that would make sense, wouldn't it? So I'm sorry, guys. I don't have that spec for you. And they haven't published a lot of specs about this yet. As soon as they do, we'll be on top of it. Okay, so do you want to go to interior or do you want to talk about news first? Can we finish with payload really quick? Yes, please. And then go to news. Okay, payload. It's actually payload's not even on here. I know. No, no, but this, uh, it's, a, it's an important point. I agree. We mentioned 12,000 pounds of max towing. Right. Uh, the hybrid is going to be rated at about 11.3, mm-hmm. 11,300, um, because of its, it's heavier. The hybrid system, because of the battery and other uh, components, which is happens with other trucks that have these types of yeah, yeah, and, and then payload is rated at one thousand nine hundred and forty, almost two thousand. That's a maximum though. Maximum with a base engine mm-hmm. and two wheel drive, um, all that stuff and the smaller cab. Um, once again, not class leading. Mm. So if you look at Ford and, and GM and, and Ram, uh, those numbers are often above 2,000 pounds of payload. And in case of Ford, with their special suspension package, over 3,000 pounds right. on F-150. But, but I think this relates to how Toyota is looking at their customer base, right? So they're not looking at it specifically maybe as the true you know, fleet truck for, cons- for commercial. Right. right. They're looking at it as a lifestyle vehicle, right? Which is exactly what they were saying. They, they kept throwing that at you guys as saying, this is a lifestyle vehicle. Uh, they, they designed it to be that way, that, from the inside out. And when we do talk about interiors, it's pretty noticeable. Um, I think, well, Andre and I, before we uh, you know, fired up the cameras, talked about what the full spectrum is. And if you look at Ford and General Motors and, and even Ram, uh, they have a full complement of vehicles that are um, work trucks and heavy-duty trucks. And that really does fill up this huge void. And then from the very top, then they go into the lifestyle trucks, the ones that you're using with your family, the ones that you're, you know, camping in or overlapping. And premium trucks. Exactly, and all that. Yeah. exactly, and premium trucks. So they cover all of it. Toyota, they're not, they don't have heavy duty trucks, and it doesn't look like they're going to introduce them, despite the rumors. I don't think that's going to happen. So they're introducing this truck as something that somebody wants to own as a commuter, as something they can have fun with, as something they can go off-road with and, you know, drive their families around in. And that is where their starting point is, I believe. Yeah, and they're not offering a two-door regular cab 
at least not yet, not right. not at this time for 2022. So I think they're looking at it, like you said, as more of a family vehicle. It doesn't ma- doesn't mean that you can't use it for work. Of course you can, uh, but it's just not focused on that, right? So what about the cab configurations then? So there is uh, there is kind of the access double cab, mm-hmm. which is a four door short cab, mm-hmm. and it's very similar to what t- t- Toyota has done in the past right. for their previous Tundra. Um, and what some others do, like like Chevy has a very similar configuration. Right. And then there's a full Crew Max, which is a full full size four door. That's cab. the one that you saw. All of the trucks we saw were Crew Max full Crew Cab trucks, and then they have three different bed configurations: uh, five and a half foot. The TRD Pro is only available with five and a half foot bed. That makes sense. Uh, there's also a crew big Crew Max six and a half or five and a half bed, mm-hmm. so you can choose. And a lot of you guys said you guys want longer beds. Toyota is giving that to you. And then if you have a shorter cab, this double option, right. you can get an eight point one foot bed, which is a true work size bed. Yep, over eight feet. Yeah, but it's not a two door uh, cab, so. Those are your choices. That's going to be an interesting looking truck. Uh, did they show you any no, of those? No, no. Uh, that's going to be, I don't know if it'll look ungainly or not, but um, the, the the ones that we're seeing all have the small beds, I believe. I don't think any of them, well, no, they none of them have the bigger beds. Well, the 1794 had the longer bed option. Oh, it did? Uh, for example, some of these trucks, like the red truck I'm showing here with the trailer, uh, had a five and a half footer. Those are 20 inch uh, wheels, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we didn't see... A lot of configurations yet, but we saw you know some of the more premium configurations. Well, while we're talking about beds, can we talk? Will I mean this kind of goes from powertrains over back once again to this? Um, like your Ford truck, do they have an outlet, an inverter, any of that type of stuff for uh, powering things? There is an outlet in the yes. bed. By the way, the beds are composite. They're not aluminum. They're not steel. They're composite, their latest molded composite. Which uh, is like the second generation of what they're using on the Tacomas, right? Exactly. Those are really strong. Uh, Very, very strong. Things bounce off of it. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to puncture, hard to damage. They don't rust. Uh, But it's a little slick. So some of the beds that they were showing, which were production kind of intent, um, you know, they were slick. You know, if you want to slide something... Uh, if you're walking, it, it may be a little bit slick on top of the bed. Mm-hmm. So e- there's either a coating that provides more traction or a, a rubber mat. mat. Yeah, I figured a rubber so, mat. So uh, they do have a 400-watt outlet. You can kind of see in, in some, some of these images. They do not have, and many people ask for this at, at the event, mm-hmm. uh, because Ford is now kind of resetting the bar with their 7.2 kilowatt inverter system. Which I think is badass. Yes, and, and could be very useful on many different occasions. Could be. You know it's a, you, you have it in well, yours. I, I do, and I love it, but I don't use it every day. You should you know, be using it every day. Shave with it, whatever. <laughs> Find a reason to use it. I would. Yes. Honey, I'm turning off the power in the house. Sorry to interrupt. And I'm going to fire up the truck and power the house just because I can. Yes. Or, fi- or, or charge my daughter's uh, electric car. Exactly. Yes. All of that stuff. I would do uh, that. Or go camping. Fi- fire up a electric grill. Which last time I checked, you camp way up more often than I do, and you take your boat out. Yes. Okay. So very useful. It's very useful. Did Toyota do something like no, that? No. No. Okay. And they were pretty hard about this. They said uh, we don't think uh, a lot of our customers need this, and we are currently, you know, considering ways how to offer that capability at an affordable price. Mm-hmm. So. I did not really get good answers on this. No, that wasn't and, a good answer. And also, 400 watts has been the standard for the last few years mm-hmm. in a lot of these trucks. Decent. You know, you can run a small compressor. You can run... You, you can charge your laptop you on can it. charge your laptop. You can p- charge a f- several devices, right? Um, you won't be able to run a coffee maker, for example. You won't be able to run some of the other bigger appliances. Um, you could charge batteries, for example. You can use for a your blender tools. for margaritas. Maybe. Doubtful. Uh, Doubtful. You're hurting but, me here. But things like their Sienna, they have the latest 1500 watt systems. Right. Why didn't they put the Sienna system I, in here? See, this is a. Remember how we started with the theme of this? Did they do enough? Yes. This is the one spot where I'm going to say, no, they didn't do enough. This should have had a similar. If they're going to benchmark Ford, why not put the similar type of inverter system? They already have the tech for it. I know I'm I'm talking you know out of my butt so to speak because Toyota, I'm sure has a huge plan that we're not seeing and they have reasons for this that have you know that are behind the scenes, but in terms of a consumer, I would say wait that doesn't have something that I can you know 
It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. I want to. I want to fire up a, a blender. Damn it! All right, all right. So, so thank you for for you know clarifying that. Let's. Uh, do you want to go to news or interior, or you want to keep going on this? Let, let's hit the news really fast, and it has to do with Tundra too. Yeah, this is all you go. So, so um, we talked about the hybrid. Mm-hmm. We talked about the non-hybrid standard three and a half liter. So there is a little bit of a timing news. Okay. So Toyota has uh, said that the Tundra is going to be available this year, but that only is related to the non-hybrid. So if you're looking at the base motor, which is a twin turbo V6, uh, that should be available this year. They're targeting end of the year. So think about December ish, Mm -hmm. uh, as far as getting uh, maybe potentially the first customers getting these trucks. I'm curious if they have the chips, but I'm also curious, but the hybrid is slated for the spring of 2022. So it's a little bit of a bummer because, you know, they, they spent a lot of time describing it and talking about it and we'll be driving some of them. <laughs> but, but I hope, I hope we'll be driving you, some We of will, them. yeah. Um, but they're not going to be on sale until spring of 2022, which means, think about like March, April, May, potentially, mm-hmm. th- that time frame. So you know what's the biggest bummer of this? Hmm. The TRD Pro is only hybrid. No kidding. Mm-hmm. I did not know that. So, that is big news. So the TRD Pro won't be available until next spring. That's so, what, that's, so they don't have the package on the regular they, powertrain? Well, so the, the way they're positioning the TRD Pro, it's premium. Mm-hmm. Not just affordability, but also if you saw some of the interior pictures, and you can get it in either red <laughs> uh, or standard. It's uh, way trim. better looking than their old interiors. So, yeah, and we'll talk about tech in a, in a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, please. But the part of this news is that TRD Pro won't be available until spring. So if you already ordered one or tried to put your deposits down with a dealer, um, you may not get your truck until spring. That's that's all I'm saying. Okay. That's that's that's, 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 that's that's a bit of a bummer. It is a bummer. All right. Um, more, news? more news? More news. So this has to do with uh, State Fair of Texas. Okay. And also Ram. Because Ram has announced uh, just this week mm-hmm. that there is a new package available for the TRX for 2022. Mm-hmm. They're calling it, did you, hear, did you hear this? Yes, I did. Ignition. <laughs> ignition. Yeah, so this is going to be a TRX Ignition Edition. Say that three times fast. I can't. Okay, I'm TRX like, like, Ignition, ignition edition. edition. Got it, okay. So it's a special orange color. Mm-hmm. So, it's, so so they're expanding their color palette, basically. And everybody, a lot of you guys have asked for more colors. Yeah. You know, because traditionally, you know, the Hellcats, the Challengers, the Chargers, there's like, you know, plum, plum crazy purple. Right, and the there's sublime. Lim- sublime greens, uh, orange colors. Well, uh, it looks like they're expanding this availability. And this I don't is know if the orange is for me. Mm. Um, I really like the TRX, our long-term TRX we have here in red. I it's think, good I think it's good looking. <clears throat> the orange is just, you could see it from space. Yep. Which could be good if you want to show off. But I don't know if I'm to that level. I can guarantee you that there will be more extreme colors. It's going to look like a pack of Skittles soon. <laughs> We're probably going to get a green very soon, a very bright one. And it, once it, it's going to go along the same lines as the Hellcats, just like they're doing now. And they'll have other additions. This is what FCA, Ram, and I'm guessing Stellantis have or will be very good at, is waiting and stretching out that model as much as they can. And then eventually getting yet another special edition and maybe add a couple things to it. So maybe it's not just a color. Maybe there's a little, couple little goodies that are part of the truck that make it unique. And that is something that I believe a lot of you guys will be into. I would love to get a separate color. It's interesting. They used to do a thing with Ram, mm-hmm. uh, with the Power Wagon. Right. If you, I think if 200 people ordered and requested the same color, they would be willing to make those 200 vehicles in that color. Yeah, and these could be odd colors. Like, yeah, weird. Like construction yellow. It's not or, green. Yeah, something, yeah. something crazy. And they might continue this. And this new TRX is also a... Um, let me get a picture of that actually here. Yeah. It also has a unique interior. And it also uh, is fully optioned, almost fully optioned, with the group le- level two group, the new wheels and t- uh, the new wheel design. It's got the r- a sports bar, you know, this uh, steel hoop in the back. Yeah, it's got the graphics on the outside. The graphics and special interior. It also has 
Um, very special, they call it copperhead orange interior trim with carbon fiber woven with orange. So uh, this okay. is doubling down, tripling down on Do orange. Do you honestly think the carbon fiber is going to make it any lighter? No, it might yeah. make it heavier. Uh, <laughs> but so, but but you know, some of the trim is yeah, very the very. Steering wheel, you could really tell. Yeah, the steering wheel it looks kind of interesting actually. Mm -hmm. um, so so limited run about eight hundred seventy five trucks will be made in this special package. They started around ninety two thousand dollars give and take destination charges. Uh -huh. So this is basically this is not. And a, a cheap version of the TRX. Not this, that there's ever going to be a cheap no, version. No, they start at 72. Many dealers are marking them up. D doubling uh, them. Sometimes doubling prices. Yep. A and so this is, you know, this is from Ram. You know, 92,000. And then there's a little bit more. There's a, also South Fork Edition, which is their premium Longhorn, kind of a Western theme. Um uh, Kind of a next iteration of their luxury interior. That and is a really good looking interior, dude. I gotta say, dude, the the way they're using the the, the various colors, the browns mixed in with the um, metal trim. There's, it's not a crazy amount of wood, and there's very little plastic. I like it. And there's also the Ram Red Edition, which is basically. Uh, of course, Stellantis and Ram, Jeep, and Fiat have been submitting, or they promised at, at least $4 million to the Global Fund mm -hmm. to um, fight against HIV, uh, TB, and the malaria, and not other diseases. Right. So they're doing a special trim of the Ram 1500 with rad badging, and it's a limited truck. It's kind of blacked out, and it will start at around sixty-five, almost 65000 Yeah. Interesting truck. And a really good cause. So if you guys really want to wear it on your sleeve that you're donating to something that is, you know, important worldwide, I guess that would be your truck. And that's kind of a way to communicate that and spread the message, right? Exactly. So so that's, um, I'm welcoming actually this red edition too. Oh, I think that um, this could be the start of a lot of interesting editions that, that actually do benefit various uh, charities. I, I like it. I like the idea. So that's a little bit of news from State Fair of Texas. Uh -huh. And so let's move on to more Tundra stuff. Yes. Okay. Going back to Tundra, you guys have been seeing this picture, if you're watching, of the interior. Now, the interior, just like the rest of the truck, is all new. And they went for, once again, a very kind of macho, manly, blocky interior. But I think that they managed to actually pull it off this time, as opposed to last time. I always thought it was kind of cheap looking. One of my favorite parts of this entire interior has to do with what's sitting in between the driver and the passenger. What's that? The shifter? Yeah, that's a proper gear lever that oh, is. Oh, yes. It's beefy. So, so there are no knobs, no, no buttons. No knobs, no buttons. Yeah, yes. you just pull it, yeah, grab that shifter, and put it into gear. Yeah, there's no manual option. It's a 10 speed. But at least you have this. I like it a lot. And the biggest part of this is something interesting because Andre and I have. Um, both kind of dealt with this, and that's their infotainment system. It's a huge bit of news. Yeah, it's a huge leap forward. It's mm -hmm. their basically um, in-house, uh, their subsidiary connected surface services company in Texas actually developed a software that's behind the new infotainment system. Right. And a lot of the trucks, actually all the trucks I saw had the 14-inch display, which is their humongous. That is now class leading. Yeah, at this time, we, uh, you know, the lightning that's coming next year may have a, a bigger 15.5 inch screen. Until it comes but, out. But right now it's yeah. class leading. And um, there's also, I believe, a 9.8 uh, inch infotainment screen that is available on uh, other trim levels. And what's interesting about this, before we go any further, is that I got a chance to see its brother uh, screen on a <laughs> Lexus NX, the new one for 2022. Yeah, you just drove it, right? I just drove it. I was at the event and I got to play with the screen. And um, it's it's slightly different. Uh, they actually did make it a Lexus only screen by adding uh, hard knobs on the screen itself for, for uh, heating and air conditioning temperature readout. And they also have in between those two knobs, they would have a volume uh, knob. Yes, knobs. Which on the digital screen. On the, just below the digital screen. Okay, so the okay. volume knob was actually separate. But it's very different in terms of its layout versus what you see here on the Toyota t uh, Tundra. And Andre will describe that for those of you who are listening. Yes. So first of all, I, can on I only experienced the big screen. Mm -hmm. So all the trucks that had available uh, for us to look at had the big screen. It's designed in a way where it 
it's it's in the center and it's jutting out a little bit up above right right so there's a um, the part of the screen that's above the dash it actually did not obscure my vision so when yeah. i was in the driver's seat I could look over the dash, and the screen was not in my view mm -hmm. um, as far as the top of the screen. Although Andre is taller than most humans. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So it did not obscure my view. Um, a lot of you made comments that it's kind of just a square attached to the dash. But in person, I wasn't bothered by it. Yeah, they actually you know? did design the cockpit around that dash, as opposed to some others who kind of make it look like they put it in with an after. Like, a, an, like an iPad. Like right. Laying, laying in there. Slap a pad So it does there. not appear to be like an iPad was slapped in the middle of it. It, it was more integrated. It than sits that. lower than I think you guys realize. So, but they did something unique to Lexus. Obviously, they want to use the same software and the and the back end. Yeah, a lot of the operating systems pretty much the and, same. And also the servers, uh, because it's also connected systems, right? Right, it's they, all on uh, yeah the cloud, and they can do over-air updates and all that uh, high-tech stuff. So that makes it a lot easier for both systems. Yeah, and then they separated the um, HVAC controls. So the climate control system on the Tundra is actually a separate row of buttons right below the screen, mm -hmm. which I thought was very, very clever because you basically it's truck stuff, right? Right. Sometimes you wear gloves. Sometimes you're jumping in and out of the truck. Exactly. You want something easy to hit, you know, up and down, temperature control, fan control. Um, so I, I was welcoming that, too. Yeah, it looks like a fairly simple setup to use. Now, that infotainment screen does an awful lot. We're not going to get into the weeds about it. But I will say that Toyota went and Lexus went from having the least capable infotainment systems and they have leaped over the competition, not all of the competition, but a lot of the competition, not only in terms of the graphics, the display and the usability of it, but the ease of use. Uh, they are voice activated and it, I think they call it casual voice activation or something. Yeah, just natural speech. You, yeah. can, you can ask a question like, what's the weather like in Denver? Mm -hmm. And the truck will actually answer. <laughs> Relatively quickly, there's yes. a minor lag, but it's, it's, it's around the same speed as your phone. And remember, everything is cloud generated. So, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if you're looking for navigation, you could quickly ask, it'll do it. I decided when I jumped into the model that they had on display, you know, which was in the middle of Phoenix, Arizona, I said, take me to Disneyland. And it took just a few seconds. It popped up all the options for Disneyland. And I could have just simply selected one and been on my way. So, you should have. Yeah. I know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phoenix was really, really hot. Okay. But but the point is, is that's a very easy to use system. And considering, you know, and this is Lexus, mind you, but I'm pretty sure it will work almost exactly the same way in Toyota. I think they did enough. I so agree with that. As far as... As far as staying competitive, maybe even resetting the bar a little bit in this in this area, mm -hmm. I think as far as technology and interaction with the truck, um, I think they did uh, more than enough to stay competitive because this also includes a lot of the gauges that we love seeing. Uh, all, uh, That's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, integrated brake controller is there. So is that standard? Do you know? Or well, with a towing package. Oh, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So, so if you get the hitch and the towing. Well, you remember in the past with older uh, uh, Tundras. Right. It you, wasn't available you, until recent years. Yeah, that yeah. was a real issue. Um, so, what about the center IP? Uh, the gauge cluster, you mean? Yep. Just, yeah, so there's two options. There's a digital one, which mm -hmm. is a screen. Where I think it's about 12.3 uh -huh. um, in diagonal. Or there's uh, you know analog gauges, which is old school. You know, mm -hmm. why change things yeah, if I you agree. don't have to? So there's options for that. Uh, many, many gauges. Um, what I really liked also on the hybrid, there's also a battery status, battery charge um, level indicator. So you can tell if the, is the battery fully charged as I'm driving? Is it half? Is it lower? Do you know how big the battery is on that? Yes. It's 1.87 kilowatt hours. Okay. So it's a little bit bigger capacity than the Ford's 1.5 kilowatt mm -hmm. hour. But it's a different chemistry. Toyota went with nickel metal hydride. Old school. Old school. They called it tried and true, which mm -hmm. is true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And also very rugged. They can take a hit. And also... Um, Ford, of course, is lithium-ion mm -hmm. uh, battery in the F-150. Um, but, and here's, this is a big but, um, switching gears to the battery really quick. Please. The battery takes the entire under-the-seat rear compartment. 
Uh, you know how you open, you know, you fold the seats up. Yeah, in the you're rear. talking about the back seat where yeah. there's a cargo space usually. Yeah, and then the F-150 hybrid, there's a giant, you know, storage box in there you can use for your items, your right. you know, emergency equipment, etc. Well, this battery takes the entire compartment, oh. so you don't have any storage there potentially. That's a that's a boo boo. Yeah, but I think it has to do with the technology they chose. I mm-hmm. think that nickel metal hydride maybe li- it's not as dense, so the, it no, has you, to be larger. It does have size. to be larger. As as if you guys are into remote control cars, this is a really good, way, simple way of looking at it. Uh, to get you know equal power out of nickel metal hydride versus lithium ion, usually the lithium is much lighter and smaller, more compact, as opposed to the nickel metal hydride. But I've, in my experience, I've seen you know those batteries being sawed in half and not catching fire, as opposed to lithium-ion having some issues, as we've seen in some electric cars, just in some cases. Not to scare you about your truck. No, no. But uh, that means the packaging is different. That makes sense. So they needed a larger compartment, possibly, yeah, to and, store these things. And in the F-150 hybrid, the battery is packaged actually within the chassis, within the frames, mm-hmm. uh, near the uh, fuel tank, uh, oh, coincidentally. Okay. No big deal. No, it's it's fine. <laughs> no, no, no big deal. No, no, but Dios. but my my but the Ford's interior is fully usable. Yeah, I got you. And then the Tundra, it's not. So that, that that they kind of failed that one because they you know honestly, that's one thing people want is more cargo capacity and, and also they want that, that potentially enough. like out of the way storage uh-huh. and lockable potentially. Exactly. So if you're storing you know valuables or your mm. backpack or something hi- hidden out of view. Uh, you could do that, but not in a hybrid Tundra. That's a real bummer. Okay, what about the rest of the cargo and the design of the interior? Awesome, I would okay. say. All so right. the center console is large. It has different cubby holes. Uh-huh. It has uh, hidden Easter eggs, you know, inside of it. Uh, Easter eggs. You know, Easter eggs. Yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We did a special story about this right. uh, already on TFL Truck. Uh, cup holders are big. Wireless charging is available. Wireless CarPlay, Android Auto is available because we mentioned infotainment. Mm-hmm. And I think in this way, ergonomically, they did a great job. The seats feel good. When I got into they look big. Uh, yeah, big, wide, and also supportive. So the whole uh, my large American uh, booty. Well, I'm not gonna vouch for that until you sit in it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Come but on, you know me well enough. No, no, I, I know. I think you would enjoy driving this truck. Okay. I, I think if you get in this. You would feel comfortable and also good visibility out front. So I think they did more than enough as far as ergonomically and design-wise um, on the inside. And the, I'm showing the red interior. I, you know, I apologize. We don't have to look at the red interior if you don't want to. Yeah, do you have another interior to look at real quick? One thing that I noticed, I, really the only thing I don't like about the interior, just, from, oh, okay, see, it's different. So in the TRD... Pro, yes. it had Toyota embossed above the glove compartment. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. No. I mean, do you have to be reminded of where your payments are going? So um, this one, which looks like it's on the high level. Uh, so this one is actually maybe not a high level. So we're showing a different interior in you case sure? you're that curious. That looks pretty snazzy. I know, but dude, but they do good quality materials across their trims. Um, if this was a 1794, that area in front of the passenger in the front would, be would wood. say would be wooden and would have a little imprint of 1794. Okay. By the way, that's the year of the ranch that that, that was established where the current factory in Texas is. Right. So in case you were curious where 1794. There's historical stuff there. Uh, historical there. If it was a platinum, it would have little platinum letters. If it was something else, it may have something else. So this could be a, either a limited or an SR5. I don't quote me on this. Wow. But still big screen. Yeah. Still nice seats. Uh, still, well, this one's a little gray. It is uh, a little gray. And yeah. also the center armrest isn't there like the other one. It looks like it has uh, storage on top and some cup holders. And then the armrests on the sides, which look like they might move or something. Well, the design of the center console is kind of the same across all trams, hmm. just different materials. So really? some may that, that's a totally sen- different center console than the um, TRD just showed me. Uh, maybe the top portion is yeah, different. Yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, the top portion was covered in a TRD and it's open here. Yeah, yeah. Exa- that's so. That's, but overall, in, it, it's not. They don't do. They don't open differently. They open in the same way, uh, except they sometimes have different covers or materials. Okay, fair enough. So I hope I'm describing that correctly. I mean, clearly enough. Um, so, I think the interior is where they did, you know, really well. Although the Toyota script has to go. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Surgery. That 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 that's just ridiculous. The mirrors don't look very big. They did not show us towing mirrors. Okay, okay, because so, both trucks had the same mirrors that I'm looking at now. Exactly, uh, which is kind of a normal standard mirror. Right, it looks like a any pickup truck mirror. Um, they in the prototypes we captured testing in the mm-hmm. wild. We've seen extendable towing mirrors. Yeah, that's but right. But they I didn't that. show them. So maybe mm-hmm. those are not production ready, yeah. or maybe there's something else happening there. So we didn't see that. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I'd the interior like, is good. Personally, I li- yeah, I like the interior. I like the most of it. Uh, kind of a big no-no on, on losing all the space underneath the rear passengers for the hybrid. And I'm not a huge fan of the embossed Toyota logo right in front of your face inside the vehicle when you're on the uh, you know, off-roader. That's yeah. just, uh, I don't like that. Oh, yeah. look at that, look at that. I, okay. want, I wonder if you can remove that Toyota script if you don't like it. Use stickers and put them over. Well, use, use like floss and like take those letters off. I, I think those things are actually shoved into it and so they're stamped mm. into the dash. That's what it looked like. I'll have to ask Toyota. You know, if <laughs> How do we get rid of the logo that you have in front oh, of everybody? That was not going to be a good question. That's not going to be a good question at all. Now, uh, let's move on. Um, we we kind of covered technology in that too. Is there yeah, anything yeah, else we want to cover? Um, I think technology, like you said, is easy to use. There's voice activation for a lot of the features. Right. Um, and it's also not very deep. So the, there are not many menus you have to go through. Everything is kind of easily accessible. So that's top. Um, and then I just wanted to mention the tailgate because we're looking at it right now. Yeah, under your And it has a very unique feature. So first of all, Toyota chose not to fight the tailgate war. So the tailgate opens one way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have a fancy fold-out or no a barn. There's no steps or anything that pop There's out. There's no barn doors. Um, it's a regular tailgate that opens one way in its traditional fashion. But they have this button, this little, um, looks like a little button on the driver's side inside the tail lamp housing. Yeah, what is it? And it's a little button. If you hit it with your finger or mm-hmm. your elbow, you could elbow it, and it's um, it's a latch for the tailgate, and the tailgate opens. So... Does it, is it servo assisted where the tailgate is automated and can go up and it, down on it its own? It doesn't have to be servo assisted. It just unlatches the latch and it's damped. You know, that's and it an just interesting idea. So that's a pressure plate I'm looking at then. Kind of a kind of a little uh, latch, I would call it. You can actually push it physically. Okay, so, and it's the, it's just that opening right there. Yeah, right there. It's not the whole piece of plastic I'm right, looking right. at. Right, right. It's a little button. Okay. Think of I it see. as a think of it as a button. Yeah. So instead of reaching in and uh, opening the tailgate in the standard you can just way, slap that thing and uh, boom it. Slap it with your elbow, and they said, you know, you, let's say you're carrying a cooler. Yeah, yeah. And you want to throw it in, but. Your hands are busy. You can just kind of slap it with your well, elbow. Well, that's sure as hell is better than waving your foot under a camera. <laughs> I got to tell you, those things never work right for me. So I'm curious to see how well this works. Yeah, I, I want you to try it as soon as we can get oh, a truck yeah. here. Um, so that's like, you know, that one little feature that's really useful and nobody else has. Okay, so you that's their saying? tailgate war. Uh, that's their tailgate war thing. Shooting shots back. Um, so shots fired. <laughs> but so... Maybe we should uh, finish up yeah. by trying to summarize. Which is, well, we still have price and MPG, but we kind of, we can't really so mention So we don't those. know either one of them. We think it's going to be competitive, uh, but we don't know exactly. But what right? does competitive mean? It uh, means the entry-level yeah. price of a Ford F-150. Let's just say the F-150 base price is roughly around... 27-ish. But now you have to remember that's a two-door cab. Right. That's a two-door, and that's with their base engine. Exactly, Uh, which is not turbocharged. Mm, Then if you look at GM, it's a similar story, right? Mm -hmm. Similar price, similar two-door cab. So now we have to uh, change. Let's look, actually. So since the uh, F-150, actually, let's go to Mm Chevy.com, Chevrolet.com, and let's look at Silverado 1500. Which is their best seller, you know, and if you combine it with GMC, mm-hmm. it's pretty much a top Plug, seller. Yeah, top seller. So uh, while he's doing that, keep in mind that recently we popped news that uh, Chevrolet is going to is, has a new 2.7 liter four cylinder engine that's turbocharged that goes into their full size trucks. We've driven it before, we've used it before. However, they've updated it big time, and it now puts out 420 foot pounds of torque. Now, when you think about that compared to oh, I don't know. A Hemi, it actually puts out more torque than the Hemi. And this is a four-cylinder engine, which is really impressive, and I hope it's as good as I think it is. 
So now we would have to look at the double cab Chevrolet, which is their shorter cab, still four doors, uh -huh. with a standard bed, which is exactly pretty much the configuration that Toyota will offer. Right. Right. So this is a smaller cab. And if I go here and I remove four-wheel drive, I'm not sure why it always makes me choose four-wheel drive. Because they want you to spend more money. Okay, and then if I choose a 2.7 liter engine, which is one of their base engines for this, currently the Silverado 1500 price right here. I can't read that from here. So old eyes. You don't have to. Um, so about thirty-seven thousand before discounts, and then they add on the discounts. So about thirty-seven. So this is two-wheel drive, base turbocharged engine, base trim, truck. So, so it's that's, this, the that's the mark. Ballpark. That's the ballpark where Toyota has to hit uh, with their twin turbo V6, which is a much bigger engine, much more powerful, a much one. more powerful engine, right. and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so if they hit that mark, you know, thirty-five to thirty-seven thousand, and I think the Ford is in this neighborhood as well. Right. Uh, then it will be competitively priced. But here's the question. Is that enough? Should they undercut them? Yes, I think they right? should absolutely undercut them. You're introducing new tech to your fans and you want return buyers, but you also want to do conquest sales. You want to grab people who are Ram, Ford, and GM fans and you want to bring them over to Toyota. How do you do it? Well, you introduce a very inexpensive twin turbocharged V6. You throw in all the stuff that you've put out there in the media about Toyota reliability and capability. And you try to drag these people to your vehicle based on the fact that you're undercutting everybody by X, you know, 5% or whatever. If you're able to do that, you will get some new customers, especially in today's environment where, you know, prices are just astronomical. And if they can keep the prices, especially with the packages, reasonable, right now, man, that would be beautiful for a lot of buyers. Now, currently, by the way, the Tundra is, the old Tundra, it's quite a deal. It's yeah. one of the least expensive trucks if you add packages to it. They're, they're pretty damn yeah, expensive. Yeah, like the current TRD Pro is in the 50s. Right. Know, 50 to $55,000. And that's where a TRD Pro with a yeah, lot of stuff on it. with a lot of options. Right. If you're looking at like, oh my gosh, a Raptor, a TRX, forget about it. Oh. But but like even a Trail Boss with a V8 could be more expensive. Exactly. Right. So Toyota has always been kind of in this more affordable space. So the question is, are they going to maintain that? I think they will. And if they do, then yes, they've done enough. If they think, hmm, people are going to come to us anyway, we can go 10% over Ford, then I think they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. Because right now what they want to do is they want to make the Tundra their value leader, and also they want to bring in more sales because sales-wise, they're way under Ram, Ford, and GM, way under. And, you know, uh, granted, they're above Nissan, but that's it. So they need, they really need to push this truck, and I think that's the way to do it. So to, just to finalize uh, this episode, mm -hmm. and thank you as always for listening to we us. We appreciate and, it. And, and, Glad and watching. Yeah. Um, I hope you find this interesting because... We have you know, a lot of little tidbits that we can share, of course, first hands-on experience. Exactly. Um, I would say, did it do enough? Okay, this is a tough one. Uh, I think they're, they've definitely caught up oh, yeah. um, to the latest tech that everybody else has. Did they do something groundbreaking, shattering? Um, I, don't, I would say no. no. I, I, I don't think they did something shattering where it's, you know, reset your mind you know, did they electrify it? Did they build it out of aluminum? No. Um, the hood and the front doors are aluminum, but they did not, you know, decrease the weight of the truck tremendously. Right. They did not use carbon fiber everywhere. Right. Um, the powertrains are pretty good on paper. Right? Yeah, they look impressive. Uh, very, very impressive. So I think they did enough to keep up where they currently need to be. And if the pricing is right, like you said, then they could have a success on their hands. That's where I think they would um, be successful. But I do not think that they did, like I said, something groundbreaking, completely uh, world beater, quote unquote. I, I, I would just say this is a nice competitive truck. I agree with you on just about everything. My biggest issue, and I know, I know it's you know, and not very deep. I just don't think it looks right. Um, I think that their design at Calti. Uh, let everybody down. I think that that truck, from the profile, looks decent. From the front, it doesn't. Andre, you're the best looking thing on that screen that I'm looking at right now. Oh, my friend. wow. Um, it looks okay from the tail. 
I know they want to be different. I know they still have that Toyota look that they're trying to maintain, but there's so many other things they could have done. So that's a big disappointment. The powertrain, the platform, the interior are all excellent in my mind on paper. So I think they did just enough to maintain um, you know, being the competitive, mm -hmm. but they didn't do enough to really wow us. They, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. You know. I'm not in the dirt with this. They, they didn't knock me out, so that's kind of the issue. And I, so I agree with you basically on what you're saying. Uh, but my overall verdict is yes, they did enough, but barely. I think the the ultimate answer will come about a year from now. Oh hell yeah! When, when we drive them. Well, not just when we drive them, but when we look at the sales numbers. Mm -hmm. That's about a yeah, year from now. Mm -hmm. uh, if they if they maintain their sales volumes. It's a decent success, yep. right? But I think the success will be measured. Did they increase? Did they increase market share, right? Did they take away other owners, you know, other customers from right. other brands? The Conquest sales are yeah. going to be the huge, the, so think, the biggest that, thing. That'll be the ultimate test. And, of course, we'll tell you in about a year. So we want to know what your perspective is, guys. Please let us know below what you think of the truck. Did they do enough? And, and why? You know, yeah, you could say, oh, it's really ugly or it's really pretty. But we want to know what you really think. So, you know, go into the weeds with it. We will be reading some of your comments. And maybe we'll comment on those comments in the later comments. <laughs> Thank you, as always, for joining us. We'll see you next time for all the latest truck news and truck reviews right here. That's right. See you later.